Hi, my name's Shawnee Davis, and this is Tycoon Talk, where I get to spend some downtime with the biggest names in business. This week, I'm meeting the visionary chairman of Hopewell Group, Sir Gordon Wu. Hong Kong is one of the greatest business cities on the planet. It produces millionaires faster than anywhere else in the world, and making money is a favorite pastime. It's also getting harder, and the question is not just how to survive, but how to thrive. I've interviewed and photographed some of the biggest celebrities in the world in my time as a magazine editor, and successful people all seem to share similar traits. I'm on a quest to discover what drives a tycoon to rise above the rest, not just to be rich, but to dominate an industry. I want to get behind the public facade and reveal their true personalities, as well as their secrets for extreme success. It all started in a Wan Chai neighborhood for Sir Gordon Wu, growing up in a crammed tenement with eight siblings who would have thought he would go on to reach such great heights. Yeah, so Gordon, we have a great view here from the top of your building. Yeah. This is where it all started for you? Yes. <laughs> Whereabouts did you live? Well, I was born there. Over there? Born right there, the DPS sign. <laughs> did you have any idea when you grew up that you would one day be standing up no, here? No, I have no idea at all. <laughs> How has Wan Chai changed since, you know, the beginning for you? Well, it's all uh, used to be four-story buildings only because anything above four, you've got to have a special permission. So it used to be all flat. So, so how did you get permission to build Hopewell Center when everything else was only four stories high? Well, I had to take the Hong Kong government to court and won because at that time, some people in government believe that uh, there's no need for offices here because this is supposed to be a Susi Wong area. <laughs> So I said, no, and Hong Kong would need some nice office space. And so I decided to pick this place and, and build it. And, and there's no reason for these people to object me, so I took them to court and won and built this building. In 1963, Sir Gordon and his father co-found Hopewell Construction Company. In 1972, Hopewell Holdings is listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. In 1980, Hopewell Center opens in Wan Chai, Hong Kong's tallest skyscraper for 10 years. In 1994, Hopewell constructs its first superhighway from Guangzhou to Shenzhen. In 2014, Hopewell is worth approximately 23 billion Hong Kong dollars. A lot of these old buildings around here are being knocked down, buildings that you grew up around. Don't you feel a certain amount of nostalgia when you see those buildings getting torn down and replaced by big skyscrapers? Well, when some of those uh, buildings don't even have toilets, I don't feel nostalgia in living in those buildings, nor in uh, really knocking them down. See, knocking them down, the whole object is try to give more accommodation space and better accommodation space. I also meet Sir Gordon's wife, Lady Ivy Wu. She's a non-executive director of Hopewell Group, but has also been very active in community work, including her role as deputy chairman of the Hong Kong Red Cross. It's a great opportunity to find out more about Sir Gordon's early days and their life together. We started with nothing. And not even, we don't, we don't own any apartment at all. He used to work for his family. So when he planned to get married, he said, maybe I have to start my own business. How did his father inspire Sir Gordon? His father always believed in hard work because his father started with a humble life. He became to be the, 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 own the most taxi in Hong Kong. He has a big family. He has um, eight brothers and sisters. So he's number seven of nine children. His mother especially always believed in education. She insists all her children has to go to university. As a young child, Sir Gordon attended Wai Yan College. His parents later paid for him to study engineering at Princeton University, which would greatly influence him for the rest of his life. I, I have very fond memories of uh, Princeton because that place, the intellectual capacity of the people are unbelievable. In the summer times, I work on the construction sites. So in a way, I was able to sample the other bottom half of 
uh, the society in the, in the trenches. Mm -hmm. and so, so in a way, then it becomes a, a complete education. Ivory Tower in one, in the, in the fall, and the summertime is another story. Is this you here at the reunion? This is the 35th reunion. Let's see that. Yeah, that's Fantastic. me there. Yes, I'm, I'm greatly indebted to the uh, education I got from Princeton. Why well, specifically? Uh, well, my first year was $850 tuition. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but uh, in our engineering class of uh, 1958, there was only 13 of us. So I add up the number, of, and I found out that this is a, what I call a money-losing joint <laughs> because they do subsidize heavily. Although my father paid the full tuition, but it's only about 40% uh, of the true cost. Really? So I recognize that it's, being there is a subsidy given by the past students and alum and, uh, and friends and, and whatever. And, and so I say, okay, this is a nice tradition. I'd like to continue the tradition. Sir Gordon believes so much in philanthropy that he has donated a staggering hundred million US dollars to Princeton University and has also contributed to Hong Kong educational institutions. Talking about education, why can't we have a Princeton here or a Harvard here to you know, educate a, a new generation of leaders? Well, Rome wasn't built in a day nor in one week. In order to be uh, a top-notch university, it takes all kinds of ingredients. Mm. Just having the money can't do it. You got to have, you know, the students are of that caliber, the professors, and and certainly the environment that that the people want to work together. And if we look at, you know, the uh, universities of the world, the Heidelbergs and the Oxford Cambridge and the Ivy Leagues, you know, they all have a fairly long history. But for Hong Kong, it's not bad because our uh, we only started about hundred years ago that we have a medical college where Dr. Sanderson went, and from that prosper into now eight universities. We are not doing too bad, but we've got to work harder. And do you believe that education is the key to the education future? Education is the key for everybody. Without education, I don't think you, you, you can do it. You know, I've so balancing being book smart with having that real life experience, the hard knocks experience. That's I think that hard knocks thing is very important as well. He may be book smart, but Sir Gordon is still very much hands-on when it comes to design. He shows me his drafting table where he works on his latest projects. Sir Gordon, you don't have a computer here. I mean, where's the AutoCAD? No, I, I have a computer, but I don't use the AutoCAD because I've been working on this T-squares for a long time. And, and, and you, you probably can't teach a note on a new trick. <laughs> <laughs> so you do all the drawings still? I still draw, do all the drawings and... Uh, the T-square has served me very well for the last uh, 50 years. When we first got married, the drawing table is in our bedroom. He got up in the middle of the night, and when idea comes, he just got up and do it. Because he wants to tell himself what he's doing is right. So we talk about projects all the time. You yourself are an engineer. Did you take it upon yourself in the actual design process? I certainly that? did. And you yourself had a hands-on, very, very much hands-on. Very much so, hands-on, and uh, I also supervised the construction. And you still do that to this I day. still do that. So you're an engineer at heart? I am an engineer at heart, yeah. He is trained as a civil engineer, but after school, he's been in property business, nothing about civil engineering. But then later on, he got involved with the highway, uh, power plant, He's so happy about it because this is what he has learned. He's very knowledgeable, I would say. He loves to read books. He's very detailed, and whatever he's doing, he, he is just a go for the detail. When I read about your history, there have been certain environmental critics, um, and you responded by saying that, you know, environmentalism is a nuisance. Uh, do you still agree with that? Well, it, it was responding to some critics who wants 100% of everything. And I say you can't have 100% of everything because the best design is probably the best compromise. So, you know, you, you can't just listen to everybody and agree with them. And if you don't agree, I'm at liberty to tell them to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly are. <laughs>
Sir Gordon is clearly not averse to speaking his mind or challenging the status quo. His new project, which will eventually include a convention center and luxury hotel, has been met with local resistance, and the planning permission process has taken decades. How much on hands uh, design have you put into this? 100%. So you I still wear a hard hat and walk the, uh, the sites, and uh, I still do that. Next, I asked Sir Gordon about his succession plan. His son Thomas holds a Stanford MBA and became managing director of Hopewell Group in 2013. Would you say that he's better at running the company than you were? Well, we'll see the results. <laughs> Actually, he's, I believe intellectually he's, he's uh, better than I am. See, when he graduated from Princeton, he was a magna cum laude guy. So I congratulated him and uh, uh, he said, oh, it wasn't too difficult. And I said, son, don't be so smug because you haven't gone to the next university yet, which is uni University of Hard Knocks. So he's going through that right now. Does Thomas get any good characteristics from you as well? Gordon is very frank. He talks his heart. People cannot take his word because he, he doesn't mean anything personal, but this is the way he talks. But I think Thomas is a little polish, more polish. <laughs> when we come back, Sir Gordon offers to take me for a spin around his old neighborhood and show me the site of his new mega project, Hopewell Center 2. Welcome back to Tycoon Talk. I've been spending time with the visionary chairman of Hopewell Holdings, Sir Gordon Wu. He's offered to take me for a spin around his old neighborhood and visit his latest mega project that will eventually include a convention center and a luxury hotel. To my surprise though, Sir Gordon's ditched his chauffeur-driven limousine for something less conventional, an electric car. So why do you like driving this car? Well, environmentally friendly. Now, for someone who doesn't like greenies, it sounds very... Uh, I very... don't like the greenies of those greenies that are not genuine greenies. Right. I love true greenies. True greenies. I don't like the pseudo greenies. So the people that actually make a difference and do something about it. Right. It's quite zippy, this thing, huh? It, well, it's faster than a Ferrari. What? Is it? Uh, yes, it is. You see, with... Uh, with electric motors, mm. there's no uh, time lag. Sir Gordon predicted China's meteoric rise early on and invested heavily in the mainland in the early 1980s. In 1994, he completed the Guangzhou Shenzhen Superhighway, the first of its kind in China. He was also one of the earliest advocates for the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, although in the end, Hopewell wasn't awarded the project. Was it slightly disappointing when he wasn't involved with the current Zhuhai Bridge project? Yes, it's a little discouraged, but his idea is, is there. So as long as his idea is there, people using it, that means he's right. When you convinced the Chinese to go into to building roads, apparently you took them on this now quite famous road trip around right. America. America. Tell us a little bit about that. You seem to like your driving. He was a vice minister of transport highway transport. We took them on a road trip and we tell them, look, I'm taking you from uh, San Diego all the way to uh, New York City. The first thing they noticed was that the roads were fairly smooth and they also were surprised that uh, it was so easy. And, and so, you know, lunchtime we hit the, the joints and nighttime we hit the motels. And a lot of fun? A lot of fun. Four days later, we were in New York City. You know, for someone who, well, purportedly you have, you're worth a billion US or more, you, you seem very humble. Well, I'm a common man. Well, I mean, no big deal for me, mm. in, in a sense. So money wasn't really the, the goal? It was more about doing something? Doing something, of course, is important. I have an expensive wife, and I certainly want to make sure she enjoys life. But on the other hand, what the hell if you make another 100 million more or less? Doesn't because make a difference. Doesn't make that much difference. We arrive at the Hopewell Center 2 construction site for an exclusive sneak peek. So Gordon, why did you choose this spot to develop your new phase? Well, because the land was available. Uh, part of it is in government hands and part of it 
uh, in private sector intertwined. Mm -hmm. So I pick up the private part and uh, negotiate with the government to buy the rest. What are the challenges of building on a site like this? Oh, extreme because the <laughs> difference in levels. Are you stripping away all the stuff and then you're going to put start pile driving? Mm -hmm. Pile driving and uh, all sorts of uh, construction gear. And when's it going to be completed by? We hope by 17, 2017. Okay. So you so come down and talk to the foreman? And talk and the... to the foreman and understand what it is. And we'll be more frequent in future. Now it's just cutting off the slopes. <laughs> when you look at that, does it fill you with pride? Uh, yes, and uh, the beauty about this building is since 30 or 30 odd years ago, it's always been uh, over 95, 96% rented. So it's been a very successful project. Very successful project. If you weren't doing what you're doing, would there be anything else that you'd be doing? A beach bum, maybe. Huh? A beach bum? <laughs> With this hat oh, on? Oh, Probably. Oh, Overage the beach bum. Overage beach bum. <laughs> After my personal VIP tour of the site, it's time to head back to HQ. What do you think your legacy will be here in Hong Kong? People may say I was crazy, but at least uh, they found that it's some truth about my being crazy. I predicted that China will be doing well in, in 1979. There were a lot of skeptics, but now when they're sitting on uh, 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 a few billion, a trillion dollars of, of foreign reserve and, mm. and prosperity, you know, you can't say I'm wrong. And do you think it's gonna be a multipolar world in the future? Are we gonna have one superpower in the West, one superpower in the East? Are they gonna be working together or is it gonna be like- Oh, they'll be working together. Nobody are forced to be alone uh, because the world is so intertwined. I also would predict that China will have true democracy that will have more than one party, but that won't come easily and that won't come soon because first of all, you got to have the stability and after it's assured, then you've got to have very high uh, education levels and the middle class, and, and then uh, the rule of law. Sir Gordon's prediction of universal suffrage in China seems extremely bold. But with his proven track record on China, I wouldn't bet against him. We head back up to his office to talk further about his upbringing and the highs and lows of his career. So is this a photo of your son? No, this is me, 1958, when I graduated from Princeton University. Oh, wow, very proud moment uh, for you. 22 years old, wondering what the future was like. Three tips for success for young entrepreneurs. Work hard, provide service for other people, and always try to improve, learn more about life. And then, you know, you can't get rich just by sitting on the beach. By any measure, you had a, you've had a stellar career, but it hasn't always been easy for you. No, I had a couple, I fumbled the ball a couple of times. One very bad fumble was in Thailand, you know, because the people there uh, don't uh, honor contracts. Sir Gordon is referring to the 3.2 billion US dollar Bangkok Elevated Rail Project. Construction ceased in 1997, with only 10% complete, as Hopewell and the Thai government fell out. Was that difficult for you and Sir Gordon at that time? Well, at one point, yes. But once, when he made a decision to write it off, he moved on. How do you comfort him if something goes wrong? It's not the end of the day, and you cannot get everything. When you have 10 projects, tend to have one or two not successful, it's, it's not a big deal. In one's life, there should be failure. You learn from it. Yeah, so what have we done? We lost some money and, uh, and, and I didn't slit my throat, but uh, came back, I told my wife, you know, that's what happened. And she has very kind words, words to me, said, be more careful next time. <laughs> Did you have a guiding philosophy from a young age or is there some sort of secret to your success that you can tell us about? Well, I was always guided by uh, several principles, I guess, and I'd like to share with uh, the, the rest of the world. Now, everybody wants to get rich, but how the hell can you get rich without rendering some kind of service or product to other people? You see, in, in, in this world, we all got to depend on other people for the product or for the service. Therefore, the first thing is that 
ask yourself, what kind of service or what kind of product you can produce so that you can sell to other people or that people would want to buy from you and thereby give you some profit. He is uh, very thorough, never give up. And uh, when he wants to do something, he will go for it. And, and I think there was a very nice American gentleman who summed it up. He said, you know, the, the, the way to get rich is either the provision of capital or provision of service. The, so I understand that service bit. That was, of course, J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan. That the, was J.P. Morgan. He's one of your thought leaders, if you like. Well, you look up to uh, him. unfortunately, I never met him. <laughs> <laughs> so in my later projects, I always say, uh, I will come in with the money and provide uh, uh, the service as well. Like the superhighway project, we put up the capital. Like power stations, we put up the capital. So that uh, it's a two-pronged approach. So this must be one of your prouder moments, being knighted and becoming a knight of the realm. Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly high honor. You know, knight commander of uh, St. Michael and St. George. Came out of the blue, but I don't object to it. I talk. <laughs> <laughs> and Prince Charles, we asked him, because it's in 1997, the, the end of the British reign, he said, will you still use it? They said, damn right, I earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Did it make you feel special having a sir before your name? I, I think so. Well, particularly useful for my wife as well. She's now called Lady Wu. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. How do you think Sir Gordon will be remembered in Hong Kong? He, his vision proven right. I think he took part of the development of China and history will tell. So I think he deserves the recognition. Sir Gordon still surprises with his sharp wit and far-sighted vision. During his career, he's designed and constructed well over 100 buildings, and his bet on China has made him one of the world's most influential engineers and businessmen. Even at 79, Sir Gordon clearly has a lot more building left to do.